So the lower limb course, what you're going to find in this is we're going to do a full anatomical overview of the areas. We're going to talk about the three different conditions and how they can coexist together. Three conditions we're going to be dealing with are medial tibial stress syndrome, we're going to be talking with Achilles tendon pain, and obviously plantar fasciitis. And about them individually, we're going to show you some really amazing effective techniques for treating these areas. Um, we're also going to talk to Monica, who's our Olympic athlete, who's had obviously her fair share of each one of these conditions. So we'll give you a real life case study value to it as well. Um, but as we've mentioned in a lot of these conditions, we've been talking about the knee. Obviously, we're talking about the lower limb. Your prerequisite for this is obviously going to be the hip. You need to be clearing all the hip restrictions in and around this area when you're dealing with any of these conditions. I say that implicitly because that's what I do in clinic and that's why I get the results that I do. So if you're thinking about obviously implementing all of these techniques, be sure that you are familiar with my hip protocol because that starts and ends there to a certain degree, then you will move into these other areas, okay? So if you're not familiar with it, make sure that you do. All right, um, I'm sure you're gonna enjoy the course. There's plenty of information there. Look, once again, we love your feedback. So any feedback that you have, put it through our social media, it'll be fantastic. So we're going to talk about the leg, okay? This is obviously the thigh, this is the leg, and we've got three specific conditions that I want to talk a little bit about with you today, and I'm obviously going to show you the techniques, um, talk a little bit about the anatomy as well, but each one of these conditions is quite unique, but they all can coexist together, which is really unfortunate if they do. So the first condition, I want to talk a little bit about the pathology itself, and that's medial tibial stress syndrome, or in common terms, shin splints. So we obviously see this a lot in our runners. We see it at usually at the start of their season. And what you'll tend to find is it's this area right through here. So this is our tibia through here. And obviously we have all this tissue in here. Now the medial compartment itself obviously is going to be an area where we get the pain itself which is down in this area here so we've got flexor hullus and we've got tib post and flexor dig so if I pull this gastrocelius off like so okay you can now see the deep compartment here and these are the muscles here that we're looking at targeting for treatment now obviously you can't do this with your clients you can't remove their gastrocelius so you're gonna have to work around it but it is this deep compartment here okay that we're going to be targeting. So we've got our flexor hullus, we've got our tib post, uh, and we've also got flexor dig as well. So they're all represented here. Okay, there's the tibial nerve, and then obviously we've got the tib post, we've got the flexor dig coming up here, and flexor hullus is deep in there. So that will be the bulk of your, basically your medial tibial stress syndrome. Now, Achilles tendon is a completely different story because obviously we're looking at overuse injuries of the tendon itself. So here it is here, okay? Now you can have pain up in this area, you can have it mid, you can actually have it on the attachment or God forbid you have it all. There is another condition that can coexist with it and it's called retrocalcaneal bursitis, okay? So also a nasty one. Find that the Achilles will swell and once again we've talked about reactive that's the first stage of the achilles tendon pain and then obviously if it's left and loaded then you end up with a chronic degenerative condition which is very temperamental and very difficult sometimes to get on top of and we'll talk a little bit about with um, mon later on our model and how she went through and what she did with hers so achilles tendon pain once again the gastrocelius is a real important area for us to be offloading because it'll take away the load into that tendon itself okay and what's also really important is the load itself we're helping manage the load because it needs load to get better okay so therapeutic changes need to be made through load but if it's excessive then it becomes a real issue okay so that's Achilles tendon pain now let's talk a little bit about plantar fasciitis now if you've got a rod through there like this not ideal, you're not gonna have a really good, suffice to say that let's just say most of our clients come through don't have a steel rod through there. But what we're looking at is this tissue underneath here, okay? This is our calcaneus here, so you'll find usually the plantar fasciitis will be here, okay? This is the most common sign of pain. However, you can get it in the forefront as well, okay? And it can be represented medially and also laterally as well. So once again, we're gonna talk a bit about some of the, the techniques that 
we can use to offload that. It is really important, again, as I mentioned, that all of these conditions can coexist together. A lot of them are based around load and excessive load. So once again, as hands-on therapists, that's the area that we're looking at and treating a lot of the time. So preventive performance oriented stuff is looking at these restrictions, getting onto them before they even become a problem. I'm gonna go now, I'm gonna let you go and have a look at the rest of the series. Okay, so we're gonna go through all of these conditions, the techniques and so forth. Gonna show you a few stretches and we look forward to hearing your feedback. Okay, how do these conditions predispose? There's, as I mentioned before to you beforehand, it's really important that the hip is addressed, so there are hip restrictions, but sometimes it won't start at the hip, sometimes it can be the, some of the biomechanical issues at the foot, so, you know, things like footwear are really, really important. Training surfaces, really, really important. I mean, if you're all of a sudden being training on the track and then you run, decide you're gonna go start running on soft ground or vice versa, or cambered roads, so uneven roads, all of these can all have an impact, especially in these lower limb injuries. Um, so it, it's important that if there's any changes in training patterns, okay, so if you've obviously had a layoff and then you're bringing yourself back into a training regime, maybe you might be doing too much too soon. All of these are predisposing factors for this condition. So as much as we try and control our environment, sometimes our environment controls us and not in the right way. So always keep in mind that if there are changes in your training, your surfaces, your footwear, any of those can all predispose to these conditions. So let's talk about the treatment for shin splints. Now, when I have clients come in when they have shin splints, usually, and I say this quite confidently, 90% of the time, it will probably be in the lower half Okay, now you will get some individuals and some athletes that have it in the upper half, but most of the time it will be in the lower half. Now the first thing you need to work out is how reactive these shin splints are. So does that mean that they actually have to run for quite a while before it actually becomes quite symptomatic or can they reproduce it quite quickly? So if they can reproduce it quite quickly, then part of what I do in terms of my treatment process is I, I assess and I treat as I go. So I might get my athletes up just either hopping or doing some calf raises and really isolate exactly where they feel it. And then we can basically go straight into the treatment from there. So I'll probably urge you to do that if you can, because it really gives you a, a great overview of really isolating the areas where we find. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the anatomy itself in this area, because shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome obviously affects this medial compartment here. So we have our tibia down here, okay? And if we just roll off, we're in this little pocket of muscles that are basically the deep toe flexors. Okay, so we've got our flexor hullus, we've got our flexor dig, and then we've got tibialis posterior. So that makes up the bulk of our medial compartment there. Now, in terms of working in this area, it really depends on how much tone and tonicity that you have in your gastrocoeus as well. So we're all familiar with our gastrocoeus, okay? So that's the head of the gastro, and then down here we'll have our soleus, okay? And then obviously we've got the Achilles here as well. So it's within the border of your tibia, in this pocket here, that's where our deep toe flexes, okay? So these are the muscles that create a lot of this medial tibial stress syndrome, okay? Now, if it develops and gets really quite bad, what can happen is some of the lining of these muscles that attach onto the bone itself can start to become sore and they can actually tear away from the bone. So that is actually quite nasty. But having said that, that's actually really quite rare. You will find shin splints will be probably come on in and around when athletes have had a layoff for a while or they're coming back and they're stepping up a lot of their training. So obviously for Mon at the start of her season, that's when she tends to feel she gets a lot of her shin splints and that's certainly common for most of them. Okay, so let's isolate exactly where we're going to work with these medial compartment syndromes. So as I said, we always will start probably in the lower half because that's where they're most symptomatic. <clears throat> now, the technique itself is actually it's actually quite easy. All we're doing is we're going to use this middle finger here to roll off the tibia itself. 
and then we'll bring the other hand over the top, okay, like so, and then we just sink down and meet the resistance of the tissue. We don't want to try and push through it, we want to meet it, okay? So that's really, really important. So as we do that, we then can run along the length of this medial compartment. Now, what I tend to do is I'll probably focus on that flexor hullus to begin with. Um, and the idea of just doing that is that you're not doing real long sweeps up this medial compartment because it won't look trust me it will not accept that very nicely so we're going to be really specific we're going to meet the, t the tissue with the, the resistance and work along it and work with it so just working along that flexor hullus to begin with okay so you'll see how I sink down meet the resistance of the tissue and work along it Okay, so now at the moment for Mon, she's not too, too tight and she's certainly not in that reactive phase with medial real stress syndrome. So that's good. But if she was reactive, then obviously we'd need to lighten our load a little bit. Okay, so we'll just trial treat the area. So what I tend to do, spend a good, say, one to two minutes just stripping through this area. And so you can see how specific I am. That pressure's all right, Mon. So don't forget to ask your clients and your athletes the pressure, sensitivity. So you work through along the border of that tibia into that medial sort of compartment. And it's at that stage you can then get your client or your athlete up, get them to do some calf raises or even hopping on one leg and see if that changes the symptoms. So you're looking at just assessing, treating, assessing and treating. Um, and there is no substitute to that, okay? So as you work through one area, then we come up and explore the next. Now, look, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the tibialis posterior because it's a really important muscle because it tends to control the foot placement, especially in runners. So if that gastrocoeus is loaded, which is what you'll find sometimes with uh, for runners, especially in that mid part of their training, if they're upping up their uh, their workload, you'll find that that tib post can also start to get overloaded. Now, if that does, then it can change a little bit of the biomechanics of the foot itself, okay? Because it obviously controls that pronation. So. That's not ideal for our runners. And any little excessive overpronation in there caused by that then also can create problems for the Achilles as well because it'll start to bring in a whipping action. Not ideal. And then that can also continue on down into that plantar fascia. Now, considering that we were talking about shin splints, Achilles tendon pain and plantar fasciitis, it's really important for each one of those conditions. So it is an absolute must for all these lower leg conditions. All right, so how do we get to there? So flexor hullus is in this lower half. So if we come up, then we'll probably hit that flexor dig. And if we come up a little bit further from flexor dig, then we're gonna be up in the tib post. So the trigger points for both of those are pretty well much right next to each other. So, but what you'll need to do is just slowly push that gastro head out of the way and then sink down onto that deep compartment in that area there. Now it is exactly the same technique, okay? We're sinking in, meeting the resistance and just slowly working through that tissue. So make sure you meet the resistance, okay? Don't be scared to sink in push that gastrocoeus out of the way as well. So it's really important that you meet the resistance the right way. Now, let's talk a little bit about the trigger points. Yes, it is important that we treat these trigger points. Absolutely. So what we need to do here is we need to be mindful of how we do it. So I'm obviously a big fan of saving our thumbs. So if we don't have to use our thumbs, let's not. So what we can use is actually the broad forearm as I like to use. So if you are going to do this, once again, you need to be really mindful for how much pressure you can put into this area. So obviously if you're coming in, you're gonna sink in, make it as broad as you can. You can feel that mon, yep. So you really don't have to push that hard. So it is a matter of just working your way in between that tibia, pushing the gastro out, and then sinking down into that tissue, okay? 
Be mindful not to put all your body weight through there because obviously if they do, you'll start to feel them contracting through their foot and then obviously they're going to guard against you. So as we know, the art of doing this sort of particular technique is all about sinking in and hitting the right amount of tissue and tissue pressure. Otherwise, they'll just push you out and that's just not ideal. And I'm not a fan of no pain, no gain. It's all about working with the tissue, okay? So that's the flexor dig. And if I come up a little bit further, I can then sink into that tib post, which is about there, okay? So Mon can take a, a fair amount of pressure because she's had a lot, a lot of work in this medial compartment. But for someone who's new to this, be mindful that you might only get away with just resting on that tissue, okay? So... The more your athletes have soft tissue work, obviously the more they'll get used to, the greater amount of pressure they can take as well. But if they're new to it, do not try and over-pressurise into this area because unfortunately, you won't. You'll probably, one, aggravate them a little bit, and two, it's not going to be an enjoyable experience. Okay, so let's just recap. We're going to do our longitudinal stripping through the lower half, which will be flexor hull. Then we'll come up hit that flexor dig, and then we hit that tib post, okay? So let's work through the tissue, doing our longitudinal glides, then we can stop, trigger point work. Now the final part is obviously, and you're all probably familiar with the passive release techniques, that means we're just gonna take the muscle through a little bit of range of movement, okay? Just really try and open up that tissue while it's starting to stretch okay, so we do that for each one of these areas here so once again we come up flex a dig in the same process again so we don't need a huge amount of range of movement okay just a little bit of dorsiflexion plantar flexion that's all we're after okay come up tip posts again terrific all right so tibia, roll off, medial compartment, obviously gastroceles here, so we need to move that away, sink into that tissue and really feel, once again, spend a bit of time through those trigger points and then finish off with your passive release techniques. Now, one of the other conditions that runners can get issues with is the wonderful plantar fasciitis, okay? So it's not just runners, I mean weightlifters, you name it, any particular type of athlete that may be involved in lower leg sort of um, loading. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy first. So for Mon, she has got a very impressive plantar fascia. I don't know if you can see there, but obviously you can start to see the outline of that fascia through there. So obviously we have the muscles there. Sorry, Mon, I know that's ticklish. But what's important is that we can have pain in that plantar fascia, obviously at the attachment to the calcaneus. And we can also have it anywhere through this tissue through here. So it's important that we try and work out where, where that sensitivity is. Now, a classic example of plantar fasciitis pain is usually first step when you get out of bed in the morning. It almost feels like you are walking on broken glass, okay? After about half a dozen steps, it starts to ease off a little bit. If it's actually really quite reactive, then you will feel it on most of the walking that you do that day, okay? And you'll tend to find that you'll start trying not to put much weight through there. So obviously that's not ideal for our athletes because they're going to start trying to shift their biomechanics, creates problems other way. You know, we've talked about Achilles tendon pain and, and obviously medial shin pain as well, the shin splints. These three conditions can, believe it or not, coexist together. So it's not unusual that plantar fasciitis may be the third part of this overall condition that, that can um, present itself. It's not ideal. Um, once again, it's a temperamental condition. So a lot of the time, there's no rhyme or reason for it, but for others, obviously, it is definitely related to load. So we need to keep an eye, once again, on that load. Now, techniques that are specific for plantar fascia, obviously, we're gonna be looking at the quadratus plantae muscle here, okay? And that can obviously have trigger points in that area as well. So we've got trigger point work we can do into that quadratus plantae and what I'm also going to introduce you to is some vacuum cupping. Now this works an absolute treat 
in terms of working this plantar fascia because a lot of the time this particular condition obviously because it's called plantar fasciitis we're obviously relating that to the fascia of the foot this works just a treat now it won't always work on every client that you get because sometimes for whatever reasons clients feet may be just really really dry if they've got really really dry it makes it difficult for the cup to actually suction on. So for those of you that aren't familiar with this, obviously we're looking at obviously using a vacuum cup, okay? So this is the gun, and obviously that is the actual cup itself. So it obviously adheres onto the skin itself, okay? So obviously it doesn't tear the skin or anything like that. It is just a lifting and offloading, okay? So what you can do with your vacuum cupping Okay, we're going to use obviously the smaller cup here. So they come in different sizes depending on the area, but this actually works a treat for plantar fascia. So one squeeze and then you're just looking at working up and down the plantar fascia itself. Okay, up to the calcaneal attachment and then down and up. You can work across as well. Now what you'll find is that you'll feel almost like bubbles underneath. Okay, now Obviously, they're not bubbles, okay? It's just part of the tissue being lifted and offloaded, okay? Now, if you can get in here and keep working this tissue with this cup, then you'll find you'll start to loosen off a lot of that fascial restrictive component to plantar fasciitis, okay? So it's just simply up and down, not rocket science, but it works an absolute treat okay and obviously disengage you just pop it off like that so I, I would always invest in some vacuum cups to make sure that you are being able to offload that area there as I said it works an actual treat you can add a little bit of dorsiflexion and plantar flexion into it as well now to come in technique wise for plantar fasciitis we're going to come in once again with the broad forearm and then we can sink down okay so i'm going to hold basically just where the achilles attaches onto the calcaneal and then we can work along the tissue itself picking up pretty well much the entire plantar fascia and working right up to that forefoot okay and across we can also hook in and work that quadratus plantae trigger point as well, just sitting on there. But I do like to work the entire plantar fascia after I've cupped it doing it this. And this obviously will make a big difference. Working across like so. Okay, quite simple. Now, once again, it's all about creating this environment to make sure that the sensitivity on these attachments obviously are offloaded. Now, when we're working by the plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendon pain, or even the medial tibial stress syndrome, it is important that we're also working the lateral compartment of the leg and we're also hitting that tibialis anterior muscles as well. That should always be the recipe, okay? And then we just basically isolate each one of these areas for treatment. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a stretch for, well, the plantar fasciitis, but also the Achilles um, specifically. Um, and it's a great stretch. And as you can see here, Mon's in the position here where she's basically got her toes in flexion. So it is going to stretch all this tissue here and also the Achilles as well. Um, don't forget, this is a sustained stretch. So obviously you can sit in that position for quite a while, but once again, be mindful of how long and how often that you do this because if you do this too much and if you've got an aggravated plantar fascia it might actually make it a bit upset so we want to do this in a symptomatic free environment okay so obviously with the toes in flexion and there's not going to be any compression or soreness through the toes and also at the plantar fascia as well So we're going to talk about Achilles tendon pain. And I say Achilles tendon pain because it comes in so many shame, sh shapes and forms. So we have obviously Achilles tendonitis, and then we obviously have tendinopathy. So there's a lot of, I suppose, confusion about those particular types of conditions. So let's 
start with, say, an Achilles tendonitis, which is basically the start of an Achilles tendinopathy, but it's through the reactive phase, okay? So it's very, very treatable at that stage if you get it early enough, and we can make a lot of changes. Um, and obviously, Mon had gone through this on the post of a hamstring um, injury that she had and developed this left Achilles tendon pain. So part of the problem is that it, at that reactive phase, you're actually not quite sure how bad it is. And you're saying, oh, just got sore Achilles. So sometimes it can just sneak into that tendinopathy. And that's obviously when it becomes completely different because the morphology, obviously, of the tendon changes. So, and then it becomes more of a chronic overuse injury of the tendon. And that can be really particularly temperamental to deal with. You know, it's one step forward, two steps back, and two steps forward, one step back. So, one of the things you can do as a hands-on therapist is obviously control a lot of the load that goes from the muscles to the tendon. But keep in mind, the actual Achilles tendon needs load. Okay, that's part of the therapeutic approach to dealing with Achilles tendon pain. So part of the problem with that is obviously it's too much load, obviously can create issues. So from our point of view of hands-on therapist, we want to try and play a role in sort of offloading that load that goes to the tendon, okay? And so we want to keep it within that realm of being therapeutic changes. Okay, so there is no doubt that your athletes, if they've got an Achilles tendon issue, then they should be doing the proper strength and conditioning for it. So there is significant exercises dedicated to that. So it is really important that they're doing that. For us, from a hands-on point of view, straight away what we're gonna be looking at is this gastro muscle, okay? So that's our big explosive muscle especially for Mon, who's a four and a 200 meter runner. And then we have our Celeus, okay? Now we do have, I'll show you on this side here, we do have a trigger point that develops in the medial Celeus. Now that mimics Achilles tendon pain just beautifully, okay? So that's an area that we'd want to probably look at. What you'll also want to do if you're dealing with Achilles tendon pain to make sure that you're not dealing with something that can mimic it. Um, and that is obviously putting your Achilles on stretch and then giving it a squeeze, okay? Now, if it's true Achilles pain, that'll bloody hurt, okay? And it'll be very sensitive. So that's a fair start. What also you tend to see is the thickening of the tendon itself as well. So those two things are really important at that reactive phase so that you're keeping an eye on it. If you're in doubt, then make sure that you send them off to get an ultrasound done on that to confirm what's happening with that Achilles. So it's very, very important. Okay, so part of what I've talked about with medial shin pain is that the, the medial compartment, tibialis posterior, is really important in terms of dealing with not only medial compartment issues, but definitely when we start talking about Achilles tendon pain because simple fact of the reason is that Tibialis posterior controls a lot of the foot placement when we heel striking out, okay? So if it's loaded and it's not doing its job, it's inhibited or for whatever reasons, there may be something else going on underlying it, then it can and it will allow a little bit of that overpronation, okay? Which is not ideal because you get a whipping action to that Achilles, okay? So that can also start up issues with it. Okay, so let's look at the technique that we're going to do for Achilles tendon. As I said before, the soleus can mimic Achilles tendon pain beautifully, okay, but keep in mind when we're working with the gastro and the soleus, we need to be focusing on both of those. So we have a couple of trigger points up high, both in the lateral and in the medial compartments here as well. So we can focus on those, okay. So what I like to do, obviously, once again, we're gonna use the fingers with a hand over the top braced and work across the actual muscle itself, okay? So it's really important that we're dedicating as much pressure within what our clients can handle across the lateral head, okay? Then we can come across the medial head as well, okay? Now, some of the things that I like to do is get <coughs> the broad forearm involved. So I will just turn the leg slightly in and then I can pick up with a really broad forearm, 
Okay, so now I can sink down into that area and work really purposeful and slow. Okay, so this is the side, I suppose this is the speed that we like to work at with this particular type of technique. Okay, so if you're rushing through here, then you're really not doing your due diligence and picking up a lot of this tone, okay, and deloading. So we're going to work it all the way up. Okay, and then we blend off and again, sinking in, going to drag the tissue over, lock down on it, and then work through. Okay, now what we also can do is we can stop for each one of those trigger points too and just sit on those, just looking at watching them deactivate, then moving on to the next one and working through. Okay, so don't rush this technique, okay? It's really important that it's purposeful because a lot of therapists just love to just smash work through really fast in this tissue and trust me, that's not the result you're going to get. Okay, so you take the exact same approach to working the medial compartment as well. Okay, so we come down to the soleus, which is our middle distance muscle, as we all know. So that's the workhorse. That one takes a lot, a lot of the load. This is our explosive sprinting muscle, gastro. So it's important that we dedicate a significant amount of time once again to this soleus. So as I said before, what we can do, address lateral and medial Keep in mind that we have that trigger point in the medial, which mimics Achilles tendon pain just beautifully, okay? So that's the same approach again, but now what you're doing is you're applying it to your soleus muscle, okay? Or soleus, soleus, depending on how you pronounce it, okay? So once again, locking down Purposeful pressure, do not try and rush through it, okay? So it's all about working purposeful, okay? Really important. Now, do not get sucked into working on the Achilles itself, the tendon itself, because more than likely what you tend to do is aggravate it, okay? So a lot of these techniques are dedicated just to offloading that tendon through there, okay? Once again, you need to explore this trigger point in the medial head, okay? Because basically it refers right into the tendon and sometimes down into the heel. Sometimes your tib post can also refer down into the Achilles as well. So they are two trigger points that you can dedicate time to, to see if they could possibly be a mimicker. Okay, so let's look at this gastrocelia stretch here now. So once again, this shouldn't be rocket science here, but once again, it's all about the foot placement and where about you are. So we're looking at obviously stretching this entire area here. Obviously, we're looking specifically at the gastro as well. Um, this is a stretch you want to hold for about 15, 30 seconds if you like. Once again, it needs to be comfortable. You can also, if you want to, if you move your foot a little bit out that way, then you can pick up a little bit more of the medial compartment. And if you bring in towards you, then you hit that lateral compartment, okay? So you can explore all those areas with this, definitely this gastro stretch. Um, obviously, there's a certain amount of flexion through here, so that will depend on how much flexibility your clients have got or your athletes have got. In terms of stretching the soleus, we've now got a separate stretch for that and a separate setup, and we'll show you that now. Okay, so the soleus stretch, obviously we'll look towards this front foot here. So what you're basically going to do is bringing the knee in towards the wall this time, okay? So what that does is tends to isolate a little bit more on this lower part of the, the soleus as well. If you want to add an increase in this stretch, then what you'll do is you'll bring the foot, put it up against the wall, simply like that, so the toes will rest up, and then obviously bringing the knee in towards. Once again, you're going to hit that soleus a little bit more specifically. Once again, 15, 30 seconds should be more than enough. Let's talk about the treatment for shin splints. Now, when I have clients come in when they have shin splints, usually, and I say this quite confidently, 90% of the time, it will probably be in the lower half. Okay, now you will get some individuals and some athletes that have it in the upper half, but most of the time it will be in the lower half. Now the first thing you need to work out is 
how reactive these shin splints are. So does that mean that they actually have to run for a quite a while before it actually becomes quite symptomatic or can they reproduce it quite quickly? So if they can reproduce it quite quickly, then part of what I do in terms of my treatment process is I, I assess and I treat as I go. So I might get my athletes up just either hopping or doing some calf raises and really isolate exactly where they feel it. And then we could basically go straight into the treatment from there. So I'll probably urge you to do that if you can, because it really gives you a, a great overview of really isolating the areas where we find. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the anatomy itself in this area, because shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome obviously affects this medial compartment here. So we have our tibia down here, okay? And if we just roll off, we're in this little pocket of muscles that are basically the deep toe flexors. Okay, so we've got our flexor hullus, we've got our flexor dig, and then we've got tibialis posterior. So that makes up the bulk of our medial compartment there. Now, in terms of working in this area, it really depends on how much tone and tonicity that you have in your gastrocoeus as well. So we're all familiar with our gastrocoeus, okay? So that's the head of the gastro, and then down here we'll have our soleus, okay? And then obviously we've got the Achilles here as well. So it's within the border of your tibia, in this pocket here, that's where our deep toe flexors, okay? So these are the muscles that create a lot of this medial tibial stress syndrome, okay? Now, if it develops and gets really quite bad, what can happen is some of the lining of these muscles that attach onto the bone itself can start to become sore and they can actually tear away from the bone. So that is actually quite nasty. But having said that, that's actually really quite rare. You will find shin splints will be probably come on in and around when athletes have had a layoff for a while or they're coming back and they're stepping up a lot of their training. So obviously for Mon at the start of her season, that's when she tends to feel she gets a lot of her shin splints and that's certainly common for most of them. Okay, so let's isolate exactly where we're going to work with these medial compartment syndromes. So as I said, we always will start probably in the lower half because that's where they're most symptomatic. <clears throat> now the technique itself is actually it's actually quite easy. All we're doing is we're going to use this middle finger here to roll off the tibia itself, and then we'll bring the other hand over the top, okay, like so, and then we just sink down and meet the resistance of the tissue. We don't want to try and push through it, we want to meet it, okay? So that's really, really important. So as we do that, we then can run along the length of this medial compartment. Now, what I tend to do is I'll probably focus on that flexor hullus to begin with. Um, and the idea of just doing that is that you're not doing real long sweeps up this medial compartment because it won't look, trust me, it will not accept that very nicely. So we're going to be really specific. We're going to meet the, t the tissue with the, the resistance and work along it and work with it. So just working along that flexor hullus to begin with. Okay, so you'll see how I sink down, meet the resistance of the tissue and work along it. Okay, so now at the moment for Mon, she's not too, too tight and she's certainly not in that reactive phase with medial tibial stress syndrome. So that's good. But if she was reactive, then obviously we'd need to lighten our load a little bit. Okay, so we'll just trial treat the area. So what I tend to do, spend a good, say, one to two minutes just stripping through this area. And so you can see how specific I am. That pressure's all right, Mon. So, don't forget to ask your clients and your athletes the pressure, sensitivity. So you work through along the border of that tibia into that medial sort of compartment. And it's at that stage you can then get your client or your athlete up, get them to do some calf raises or even hopping on one leg and see if that changes the symptoms. So you're looking at just assessing, treating, assessing and treating. Um, and there is no substitute to that, okay? So as you work through one area, then we come up and explore the next. Now, look, I'm gonna talk a little bit about 
the tibialis posterior because it's a really important muscle because it tends to control the foot placement, especially in runners. So if that gastrocoeus is loaded, which is what you'll find sometimes with uh, for runners, especially in that mid part of their training, if they're upping up their uh, their workload, you'll find that that tib post can also start to get overloaded. Now, if that does, then it can change a little bit of the biomechanics of the foot itself, okay? Because it obviously controls that pronation. So. That's not ideal for our runners. And any little excessive overpronation in there caused by that then also can create problems for the Achilles as well because it'll start to bring in a whipping action. Not ideal. And then that can also continue on down into that plantar fascia. Now, considering that we were talking about shin splints, Achilles tendon pain and plantar fasciitis, it's really important for each one of those conditions. So it is an absolute must for all these lower leg conditions. All right, so how do we get to there? So flexor hullus is in this lower half. So if we come up, then we'll probably hit that flexor dig. And if we come up a little bit further from flexor dig, then we're gonna be up in the tib post. So the trigger points for both of those are pretty well much right next to each other. So, but what you'll need to do is just slowly push that gastro head out of the way and then sink down onto that deep compartment in that area there. Now it is exactly the same technique, okay? We're sinking in, meeting the resistance and just slowly working through that tissue. So make sure you meet the resistance, okay? Don't be scared to sink in push that gastrocoeus out of the way as well. So it's really important that you meet the resistance the right way. Now, let's talk a little bit about the trigger points. Yes, it is important that we treat these trigger points. Absolutely. So what we need to do here is we need to be mindful of how we do it. So I'm obviously a big fan of saving our thumbs. So if we don't have to use our thumbs, let's not. So what we can use is actually the broad forearm as I like to use. So if you are going to do this, once again, you need to be really mindful for how much pressure you can put into this area. So obviously if you're coming in, you're gonna sink in, make it as broad as you can. You can feel that bond, yep. So you really don't have to push that hard. So it is a matter of, just working your way in between that tibia, pushing the gastro out, and then sinking down into that tissue, okay? Be mindful not to put all your body weight through there because obviously if they do, you'll start to feel them contracting through their foot and then obviously they're gonna guard against you. So as we know, the art of doing this sort of particular technique is all about sinking in and hitting the right amount of tissue and tissue pressure. Otherwise, they'll just push you out and that's just not ideal. And I'm not a fan of no pain, no gain. It's all about working with the tissue, okay? So that's the flexor dig. And if I come up a little bit further, I can then sink into that tib post, which is about there, okay? So Mon can take a, a fair amount of pressure because she's had a lot, a lot of work in this medial compartment. But for someone who's new to this, be mindful that you might only get away with just resting on that tissue, okay? So the more your athletes have soft tissue work, obviously the more they'll get used to, the greater amount of pressure they can take as well. But if they're new to it, do not try and overpressurize into this area because unfortunately you won't, you'll probably one, aggravate them a little bit and two, it's not gonna be an enjoyable experience. Okay, so let's just recap. We're gonna do our longitudinal stripping through the lower half, which will be flexor hull. Then we'll come up, hit that flexor dig, and then we hit that tib post, okay? So let's work through the tissue, doing our longitudinal glides. Then we can stop, trigger point work. Now the final part is obviously, and you're all probably familiar with the passive release techniques. That means we're just gonna take the muscle through a little bit of range of movement, okay? Just really try and open up that tissue while it's starting to stretch, okay? So we do that for each one of these areas here, okay? So once again, we come up, flex a dig, and the same process again. So we don't need a huge amount of range of movement, okay? Just a little bit of dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, 
that's all we're after. Okay, come up, tip posts again. Terrific, all right, so tibia, roll off, medial compartment, obviously gastroceles here, so we need to move that away, sink into that tissue and really feel, once again, spend a bit of time through those trigger points and then finish off with your passive release techniques. So a good stretch for the anterior compartment because what is very neglected is that obviously that anterior compartment, it is the opposing compartment to our posterior where most of our problems are. So Mon's gonna show us a little bit of a stretch and a mobilizing technique that she does for that anterior compartment. Very, very simple. So part of recognizing and doing this is if you haven't done this type of stretching beforehand it's really important that you test the waters first okay mine's been doing this for a number of years so she's very used to it but it is one that you need to want to put in your uh, your, your regime because as i said before it's an area that is often really missed as far as i'm concerned all right mine so let's just get you to roll back into that position so she holds that position how long do you normally hold that position for mon 15 seconds. About 15 seconds, so that's more than enough. Okay, so you can see how she's stretching right along that anterior compartment there. Hi everyone, we're uh, lucky enough to have Monica Brennan here, one of our Australian Olympic 400 metre runners. She's joined us for our Q&A, so thanks for joining us, Mon. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Uh, look, I've been lucky enough to be treating Mon for about two years now, I think, and, and it has been my pleasure, there's no doubt about it. She's got some really amazing history. Um, we're going to talk a little bit to her about, one, how she got into 400 metre and 200 metre running. We're also going to talk a little bit about, unfortunately, some of the injuries that she's uh, um, she's gone through which has not been ideal but for a hands-on therapist it's really really important for you to learn from that and also from an athlete's point of view so Mont, let's uh let's talk a little bit about your history how did you get involved in obviously track and field and, and obviously yeah. the 200 meter um i started when i was a young junior like five years old joining little Aths, um and just went through all the phases in little Aths, all the way through to seniors athletics where you start about 16 17 yep. yeah um, and then, yeah, I've gone all the way through. And um, when I was young, I was 100, 200 meter sprinter, like purely, like wouldn't touch anything over 200 meters. Um, and it was 2016, it would have been where I made the step up to 400 meters. So, okay. yeah, it was like a big change for me. Um, so like, I've got to ask why. Yeah, what brought that on was, well, I suppose like as I got older, I was slowly phasing out the 100 meters yep. and um, it got to the point where I was kind of like done with all that 100. Yep. And I've always done hundreds and 200s, like two events. So then I was like a solo 200 meter runner. Yep. And um, people started bringing up the 400 and I was against it. But then um, last year, or like leaning into Rio, the 4x4 girls made the Olympic Games. Like they'd yep. be qualified, whereas the 4x1 team, which I'd originally been part of, hadn't. So um, I saw an opportunity. And, yep, great opportunity. Yeah, yep. That was enough incentive making yeah. the Olympics to make me step up and go yeah. for the 400. So that's what I did. So, like that, you know, that's a massive ask to go from two to four mm. in that short amount of time as well. And obviously, to make it at that level. I mean, how did your body cope with the change from two to four? Um, my body actually coped pretty well with the training. I mean, like, my um, coach is quite smart and we upped it gradually like i started off 200s and then we went to 250s 300s yeah. and then 400s um it was more the shock mentally of, yeah I'll, yeah of running past where i normally finish the and then realizing i'm only halfway through my yeah. race yeah that was just yeah a big barrier for me to overcome but yeah i, I think i dealt with it pretty well oh look you did there's no doubt about yeah. it but that uh, there's obviously going to be that headspace you know when you're running from two to four and you're like at 300 and i've still got another 100 in me yeah yeah. How did you find that like last hundred? Usually that transition because that's that's usually a really pretty hard headspace. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'd always done two hundreds and like run it hard from the start, so I knew what lactic felt like, yeah. but I never knew what lactic felt like <laughs> for like fifteen <laughs> seconds. Yeah, um, and that was a shock in itself. I know 
every single time I finished a 400 meter race last season, I would be like, I'd finish, I'd look, fall on the floor, so, be heavy yeah. breathing, like almost sometimes in tears. Yep. And all the other girls are just walking around trying to shake my hand. And I'm like, please, <laughs> I need space. You need to leave me Because you're arrogant. Yeah. This. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it was just that yeah. mental battle of just especially lining up on the start line and knowing that that pain was coming yeah that was it gets yeah. scary no no it's no. amazing how much you can get scared from that 300 meter mark is where you feel like you're just going up and down as yeah. opposed to actually going forward yeah um and i know a lot of 400 meter runners always talk about that and um obviously that was obviously got to be a shock to your system going through that you know oh my god i'm going up and down as yeah. i'm actually going forward yeah definitely a huge shock but it's actually interesting because i'm after a while, I really started to enjoy the feeling that you get in that last 10 meters. Yeah. And it's yeah. kind of like, yes, I made it because there's so many points throughout the race where you think you're not going to make it. Yep. So it's um it's got its own little rewards in that. And I yeah. started to really focus on the enjoyment that I got or the satisfaction I got after completing yeah. a 400. Yep. And that sort of made me look forward to doing it again. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. If you focus on the pain, you'll never no, go back. No, absolutely. Yeah. One of the things we should also mention, your dad's your coach as well mm. and has been like, yep. for pretty much your entire my whole athletic yeah, career. Wow. Yeah, he so, started off when I was five. He would coach me up our driveway. <laughs> We'd do um, little like 20-minute yeah, sprint, sprints, sprints yeah. up the driveway and he'd be like giving me tips. He always tries and coaches all us yep. kids. So, yep. yeah, that's how that started. And you also come from a family of... Ten, don't you? Yeah, I've got nine brothers and sisters. Wow, that's incredible. So, yeah, when I say he's always trying to coach us, he yeah. coaches, like, my brothers in football, in cricket, and yeah. always. So, yeah, oh, it's fantastic. in his nature. Oh, I had the pleasure of meeting him too, and he's an absolute ripper. And what I just, you know, what always amazes me about you, the fact that you really haven't had much injury history, apart from this, obviously, this last sort of 12 months. But up until then, you've pretty well much been injury-free. Mm, yeah, I think, and my dad's played a big role in that. Mm. I mean, yeah, if yeah. I wake up one morning and I feel like crap, I'll be like, Dad, I feel like crap. And he's like, we'll change the session or we'll yeah. move it to another time. Um, yeah, because we're always, like, living together. We can yeah. always adapt and stuff. But, yeah, um, Dad's approach to training is very, like, short to long. Yep. So we focus on quality rather than quantity. Um, and being a 100 and 200 metre runner, I could get away with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Stepping up to the 400, 400. <laughs> the quantity unfortunately had to increase. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I dealt pretty well with that. For a long time, I, yeah. my body held on and then, yeah. yeah. Kind of All right. Run us into Rio. Mm. Okay. So, obviously, what to, we got down to basically the last or the last wire, if you like, in terms of being able to qualify for Rio, didn't you? Really? Um, yeah. So, how selections worked for the relays was they'd pick it absolutely last minute. Yep. So, you had to kind of keep racing all throughout the time. So, I started my season in about – august like october yeah, that's right, and then yeah. i went all the way through until august so yep. that was a whole year which in itself i hadn't ever gone that far before i'd done mm. a lot of international comps but they'd be in june july yeah. so that was it was a very long season to begin yeah. with because um, you went to, i remember you went to japan that time and you yeah yeah because you ran well in japan didn't you that yeah. that was and then i remember well, I'm not saying that you didn't run before that, but, yeah. you know, that was sort of like it tended to be, this, you know, the, the start of it all for you, wasn't it, in terms of that, that Japan, hitting those? I went to May in yeah. May in Japan, and that was like the start of my international kind of competing. Yep. And then I came back and did some domestic, Domestics. and then went back over and did some international. Yep. I'm not the best with travelling too, so it's a lot of travelling. I was very, like, I was getting towards yep. the end of, you know, you can feel it when yep. you're sort of getting towards the end of, your season, yeah. so yeah. Okay, all right. So let's jetson to to Rio. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know after you left, you were running like a storm. You were just flying, and I remember speaking to your dad when you're in the pre camp at Miami, mm. Miami was another thing. Yeah. And um, he jets off back to Australia, and you're heading off to Rio. And he said, "Oh, you know, you're just flying. You know, hitting PBs, and and which was fantastic. Yeah. Obviously, going over to Rio. Tell us about Rio. Yeah. Um. So like. We flew into Rio straight from our training camp in Florida. Yep. Um, and we had like, I think, 10 days before the 4 by 4 girls were due to race. So quite soon. Um, and yeah, just like basically like we flew in. It was like a 10-hour flight and straight off the plane just into training too. Yep. And, you know, you're surrounded by the Olympians. You're at the training on the warm-up track and the Olympic stadiums in the background. You can yeah. hear the gun going off. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and it was 
so great to just train with, you know, you're running and then Mo Farah runs past and yeah. And, or Usain Bolt's there and yeah, yeah that was really yeah. cool. Um, so yeah, lots of training, training really fast. Um, for me, I suppose like my first Olympics, I was, I was taking it all yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. It was such an opportunity. Um, and I felt a little bit of pressure. I mean, being on the four by four squad, you know, not everyone gets to run. Yeah. It's very high pressure there too. Competitive. Yeah. First time, like my coach, my dad wasn't there with me, like yeah. supporting me and he knows me so well. So yeah, I didn't really have like everything I needed there and stress and lots of things kind of got to me. And I tore my mm. hamstring five days out from yeah. the race. Yeah, yeah. Which is my first ever injury yeah that's the first hamstring and and it was a rare one too wasn't it because the thing was it was it was high Mm. and it was biceps fem so and it didn't behave like your normal hamstring because it was obviously a little bit you know oh my god i wasn't hit the ground and oh my god i'm in you know all sorts of pain it was you know there was pain there was stopping you from running yeah and it wasn't until you got that mri that it was actually confirmed that yeah you had the biceps fem wasn't it yeah i mean i was running and i felt like a pop and because i'd never Mm. taught anything i was like well that can't be good but yep. i mean i thought i was okay and i remember the couple of days later i was like to my team i was like look guys i'm running it's cool i'm fine <laughs> yeah. and then they made me get an mri and um i saw yeah. like the mri and like there was like yeah. a tear yeah and that's when i accepted uh, it yeah before then i really thought i could have still in run. denial yeah, absolutely exactly for sure. it's amazing what yeah. your mind can say yeah so um Character building moment. Yeah, yeah definitely. Huge. Um, and obviously being at the, the games, the girls obviously went on and ran and ran well, didn't yeah. they, as well. Um, get back, mm-hmm. obviously, to Australia and obviously get through the rehab of the hamstring and so forth. Obviously, takes its time. Um, obviously, you heal like a gem and you did and then you get over that and then what happens for you then? Yeah, so I was basically, like they told me it would be eight weeks until you're running and I'm like, yeah. this is going to take ages. It's going to set me back so far. I was like dramatising it. And then I was eight weeks um, post-injury and I was like, look, I'm running. And I was literally yeah. like about to put my spikes on and sprint and then my Achilles just got so like swollen yeah. and I couldn't even walk on it one day. Yeah. It was just after yeah. a session and once again, I don't really know injuries that well. I was like, oh, I've got a bit of an inflamed Achilles and then yeah. I tried to keep training on it for about two weeks and then went to see someone about it yeah. and, yeah, got told it was Achilles tendonitis. Yeah. yeah. And then obviously developed into a tendinopathy. Yeah. yeah. So and then we went through the twos and fros and the roller coaster of tendon pain, which is it is what it is. But, you know, you're not, you're not like I'd have to say, you've dodged a wonderful bullet, you know, mm-hmm. your, your rehab coming back from there, doing the specific exercise, getting your treatment, all that sort of stuff, you're back and no tendon pain yeah yeah it's been nine months now yeah which is now this now i know this is a long time but nine months and yeah i'm pain-free back to full-on training um yeah like in my winter season now so yeah and pushing forward for Com games for yeah, next year and, games, and tryouts then, coming up yep. so that's the big one and, and then want to get it right come on thank you so much for joining us we really appreciate it oh, you're welcome And now we're going to look at the gastrocnemius muscle. This occurs in the calf, and in the calf itself, there are actually five separate muscles which live in different compartments. The gastrocnemius is the largest and is the most superficial of the muscles. It attaches, it actually runs across two joints. It runs across the knee, and it runs across the ankle. At the proximal end, there are two strong tendons which separate and they join into the back of the femur which is the long bone of the thigh then the two parts of the muscle come down they join together and they form this which everybody knows this shape in the back of the calf gastrocnemius means stomach of the calf stomach of the leg actually and uh, it just gives shape to the leg. The muscle then runs into the Achilles tendon, which is the biggest and strongest tendon in the body. The gastrocnemius acts primarily as a power muscle. And when it contracts, what it does is it will propel your foot forward. 
during normal walking, the gastrocnemius actually doesn't add a lot to your normal, simple, quiet gait. But the moment you leap forward, run, jump, it becomes utterly vital and helps to propel you forward. Trigger points will be set off in this muscle if you climb a hill, if you go for a run that's unaccustomed, especially running through soft sand, if you wear high heel shoes, and if you rest your foot on a footrest where there's pressure on your calf, that'll often set off triggers in this muscle. There are four trigger points in the gastrocnemius. The first and the most important and the commonest occurs here, which is you can see on the lower part of the medial belly of the gastrocnemius. And this will refer pain down on the inside of your ankle, into your heel, and on the inside of your foot. The three other trigger points, which occur higher up on the medial side, lower down on the lateral, and higher up on the lateral side, will cause pain locally. So you will feel pain in this area where the trigger points occur. So you can see the two patterns are completely different. We're now going to look in more detail at the soleus muscle. And this is a, a really a big, strong muscle. It attaches at the top to the tibia, which is the big heavy bone of the, of the lower leg. And then it is, you can see a very broad muscle, which runs all the way down and, it, and inserts through the Achilles tendon into the back of the heel. The muscle itself, the name soleus, it actually has the root sole, S-O-L-E, which is like a flatfish. <laughs> so the muscle really does look a bit like a flatfish. When the muscle contracts, what it will do is it will cause the heel to rise upwards. You can see as the muscle contracts, the heel rises upwards. It's a powerful muscle and therefore it is very much um, the two, one of the two most important muscles to propel the foot forward as you walk or run. Trigger points therefore can be set off in the muscle when you say go walking or running on um, sandy ground where you, the, this, this particular movement actually becomes quite difficult or if you do unaccustomed running and again you may set off triggers if you've got really stiff shoes or if you go skiing or if you go skating in shoes that in, in, in boots that don't have decent support often triggers can be set off there's another really fascinating um, function that the, the soleus has and it is often viewed as the second heart in the body because often what happens is blood comes washing down in the arteries and the way it gets back up to the heart is it runs through quite large veins which run in the body of the soleus muscle. These veins have one-way valves which allow the blood only to go upwards. So every time the soleus muscle contracts it will push the blood upwards to back to your heart. If the soleus muscle has triggers in it, this actually may interfere with this incredibly important pump. Um, there's one other factor which I didn't mention, and that is walking on high heel shoes. If you walk um, often on high heel shoes, it, the soleus muscle is in a chronically shortened position, and this may perpetuate triggers if they have been set off in the first place. We'll now look at where the triggers occur, where the pain occurs. It's important to remember that this muscle is actually a deep muscle. The gastrocnemius, which is the 
big calf muscle actually sits over it. So again, to find triggers in the soleus, you often need to dig quite deep. The first trigger occurs up near the top, and then you have a second trigger which occurs about halfway. In fact, in the division, the gastrocnemius divides into two, and in the middle, in the division just below your calf muscle, main calf muscle, that's where the second trigger for soleus occurs. There's often a third one just a little bit to the side. So this is the most common area and then there's an area up at the top. The pain in the soleus may be felt in a number of different places. This top trigger will cause pain in the top of the calf, just in this area. The lower triggers will cause pain which runs over inside the Achilles tendon and it runs down into the back of the heel so it is you know a really common presentation which is heel pain or Achilles tendon pain and you can tell whether there is actually an actual inflammation a tendonitis in the Achilles tendon is if it is tender and swollen if there is no tenderness and swelling in the tendon itself, then you must suspect a trigger point coming from the soleus. There is a third place that this, this pain actually will extend under the heel. And we'll look at that right now. The Achilles tendon pain, or the pain over the Achilles tendon in the back, actually extends further into the heel and covers the base of the heel. And heel pain is a very, very um, common occurrence. Usually it's called plantar fasciitis because the plantar fascia runs through here. And um, you know, often it does occur from there, but it may well come from a soleus um, trigger. One of the catches is that if you do an X-ray and you see a little spur on the base of the foot, immediately your doctor would say, aha, your heel pain is coming from that spur. The spur itself is actually um, just a reaction of your body to the pulling in this plantar fascia. And it, all that's happened is that your body has laid down some extra calcium in the plantar fascia itself. There, when people look very carefully at it, the spurs are not usually a cause of pain in the heel. And if you have pain over this area, which extends up the back of your Achilles tendon, especially if you don't have local tenderness in this area, even if there is a spur, the pain is actually usually from a trigger point in the soleus muscle. Tibialis anterior. I'm now going to talk about the tibialis anterior, which is this muscle here. The tibialis anterior comes from the Latin tibia, meaning pipe or flute, relating to the shin, and anterior meaning before. This muscle, also known as the tibialis anticus, is the largest of four muscles in the anterior compartment of the leg. It is situated on the lateral side of the tibia and overlaps the anterior tibial vessels and deep perineal nerve in the upper part of the leg. Its origins are the lateral condyle of the tibia, the upper lateral surface of the tibia, and the adjacent interosseous membrane. Insertion is on the medial and plantar surface of the medial cuneiform bone and the base of the first metatarsal bone of the foot. This muscle dorsiflexes the ankle joint and inverts the foot. It is used when walking and running by preventing the foot from slapping onto the ground after the heel strikes. It lifts the foot clear off the ground as the leg swings forwards. Pain to the tibialis anterior can be caused by direct trauma, twisted ankle, ill-fitting shoes or boots, walking or running on an uneven surface, stubbing your big toe, or overload from walking or car pedals. Symptoms include burning, 
cramping or aching, swelling, tension and weakness. These symptoms may come and go or be persistent and they may worsen depending on your activity level and how much you have exercised your leg muscles that day. Active trigger points usually occur in the belly of the muscle, with pain being referred down to the front of the shin, the medial side of the ankle and foot, and sometimes extending as far as the big toe. Other symptoms include weakness in dorsiflexion movement, as well as drop foot that causes tripping as well as weakness in the ankle. Usually they will not complain of nocturnal pain. Pain from trigger points in the tibialis anterior usually occur in conjunction with trigger points in other muscles. Self-massage techniques can be helpful, but you need to be careful if there are varicose veins. Balls and pressure tools may also be used, as the muscle is fairly superficial. General advice would be to avoid long car journeys. You can adjust the car seat and use a wedge under the heel of the foot for the car pedal if need be. Changing the running surface and avoiding walking for prolonged periods on sloping surfaces is also recommended. And stretching the muscle will also help to alleviate some of the pain. I'm now going to talk about the tibialis posterior, which is this muscle here. The tibialis posterior comes from the Latin tibia, meaning pipe or flute, relating to the shin, and posterior, meaning behind. It is the deepest muscle of the deep posterior compartment of the lower leg. The deep posterior compartment muscles also include the flexor hallucis longus, FHL, the flexor digitorum longus, FDL, and popliteus muscles. Its origins are the lateral part of the posterior surface of the tibia, the upper two-thirds of the posterior surface of the fibula, and most of the interosseous membrane. Insertion is at the tuberosity of the navicular and the plantar slip attaches to the medial cuneiform. The primary function of this muscle is to provide stability to the lower leg. It also facilitates foot inversion, swiveling inward, and aids the ankle's plantar flexion, flexing the foot or toes downward. Additionally, the muscle performs a key role in providing support to the foot's medial arch. Any dysfunction of the tibialis posterior muscle may result in a condition known as flat foot syndrome in children and adults. Pain can be caused by arthritic toes, poor footwear such as heels or orthotics, sports such as walking, jogging, running or sprinting, hypermobile ankles, flat feet and prolonged driving can also cause pain in the tibialis posterior. A person with trigger points in the tibialis posterior is likely to complain of pain while walking or running. Pain is generally felt in the sole of the foot and Achilles tendon, and sometimes, though to a lesser degree, in the mid-calf and heel. Usually it is more bothersome while walking or running on uneven surfaces, gravel or cobblestones that are sufficiently irregular and require additional stabilisation of the foot. Stretching is excellent for disabling trigger points in calf muscles. Swimming is a good exercise too, whereas self-pressure or pressure tools are not recommended. Runners and joggers should exercise on flat surfaces. Footwear should have adequate arch support and Morton foot structure should be corrected if relevant. If you found this video useful and want to see more like this, make sure you subscribe below and don't forget to hit the notification bell.